So let's go right back to uh, Kleena, because the first one, where are you there, Kleena? Um, so um, Ahmed uh, texted in um, a great question, and he asked, um, was there any internal um, cultural resistance to the data-driven change that the Irish Times has, has been going through? And if so, what, how did it overcome, how yeah, did you overcome it? Um, I saw that question there on Twitter, actually, and it is something <laughs> that we do get asked quite a lot. Um, absolutely, there was um, some resistance to the change. And what I would say on that is it's a constant exercise. So this isn't something that happened overnight. Um, it, takes, it can take years to implement, and it, I would say it's still, it's still ongoing. Um, so a couple of things on it, I would say. Um, one is looking at others in the industry. So we we would uh, look very closely to the New York Times, to the Guardian, to the FT, and see what they're doing. And it helps our case when we're saying we want to bring in more of this or showing reporters the performance of their content. It helps when we know that the Guardian have done this or the New York Times have done that um, and seeing it that way. And the other thing I'd say is, um, I mentioned about the quick wins. I, I'm a big believer in finding those quick wins. So, um, so when we started out with the analytics function, um, the company was about to embark on a digital subscription shift. Um, so the, the uh, team was set up a year before that. Up to that point, we didn't have a relationship, a direct relationship with our readers. They went into a news agent, they handed over their money, they bought the paper, and we didn't know about them, what they were reading, what they weren't reading. So it was imperative for us when we were setting up that function to know about our customer. So we were able to go to senior management and others and kind of say, you know what, here's the number of articles people are reading, here's where we should set a meter or not, here's the impact that we'll have on our traffic and our advertising. So showing a couple of quick wins uh, and bringing people over and again going back to the, the communication piece really really important it's all about relationships um, and it is about uh, talking to people and the reputation of the team and the people you hire in that team are representing um, yeah. That, yeah it sounds like the the other teams are nearly hungry for that data now and they're they looking forward now. to seeing their stats yeah and that's the that's yeah. the important shift because yeah. we could have bulldozed in and yeah. then you have the walls will go up yeah. um, yeah. and you'll you'll have that fear of it so we we have to to treat it in that way so be good um, I was really fascinated, um, Kritika, about the, the Disney um, journey um, and the customer experience. Um, I know a few people over from America, and I think Orlando is like the new Taito Park with people visiting it as, <laughs> as often as they can. Okay. But um, um, I was just wondering, um, I think Disney is a great example, but could you bring a more concrete example of how that applies to Davy and you know, your customers and your business oppor opportunities and, and how, how, how that re relates to your business a little yeah, bit Yeah, so we're, we're probably in one of the early stages. So we're mapping out personas at the moment. We're trying to understand. Um, so we're, we're in the, how do I put it? We're in the gathering slash connecting phase in the implementation side we've had a good strategy session we've got the senior leaders on board um, and I think it's it's at that stage where we're trying to see the data that we have and the personas that we think are the target audience and do they actually match up or are we do we understand our customers well enough to even define our target audience in that space because I think wealth management as an industry is not really recognized in Ireland. It's a big deal in the UK and the US, mm -hmm. but I think to understand wealth management, it's, it's still, you know, still bucketed with you know, stockbroking and private banking. Yeah. And so I think it's, there's, a, there's a growth in the brand awareness that has to happen in the industry awareness. And I think as part of that, we will probably reap the benefits or at least under, help uh, bring that market up to speed. But yeah, so in Davy at the moment, we're, um, we have, I hope there's someone from my team here, hello. Mm -hmm. But the guys uh, in my team are at the minute working with the strategy and the CX team to help build those personas at the minute, so. And um, at the end of the day, you know, senior management just want to sell more or increase their margins and, you know, retain their customers. What kind of um, metrics and how does your work, you know, feed into that? Can you prove the ROI of the work you're doing or is that to come um, down the line? Yeah, no, I think the, the agreement on the metrics happened. <laughs> so the, that, that, is, that is definitely clear. It's, it's always hard with marketing campaigns to prove ROI. That is probably the trickiest bit, especially when you're always going with last attribution. You're always going to attribute success off something to the last action someone took. So even though the journey might be long, it's probably the very last download that they did that probably is going to get the um, benefit uh, or this 
or the, uh, the attribution of the success. So I think that's where we have to crack that a bit more and understand how we can um, improve ROI and marketing mm -hmm. campaigns. But otherwise, I think um, the other metrics we are working through, but it's mostly NPS. So it's very much customer satisfaction and engagement driven that we want to try and bring through and get senior management to you know, agree on that, yeah. not just uh, business benefits. So. Yeah. Absolutely. I think sometimes you have to play the long game like Disney would do, you know, delight the customer. You know, sometimes you don't see it in the metrics straight away, but over time that yeah. builds up a huge loyalty and, and a kind of fan base nearly Absolutely, for your yeah. brand, right? So yeah. that's, that's what you're trying yeah. to do. Has anyone else any thoughts on that? Maybe you, you, you do similar UX customer experience work in Accenture. Do you, do you have a similar view of that? Yeah, and I guess in the dark we're multidisciplinary, and I guess it, like the user experience is key. So we have a whole, uh, we bought the design agency Fjord a couple of years ago, so we have a Fjord design agency and the teams that we put together to solve what might be seen as AI or analytics problems always have a designer on them to make sure we're understanding properly the user experience. Yeah. I think it is the, the realization that great products and services, people have so little patience for a bad product. Mm -hmm. I love the, the idea that the, the baby, like trying to swipe the magazine, mm -hmm. and you know, if technology doesn't work, yeah. um, they just have no time for it. Uh, obviously, the magazine doesn't swipe, but yeah, <laughs> it should, and it will someday. So, yeah, really? they're just ahead of their time. Um, so, we're going to uh, move into a few more um, slightly tech. Oh, interesting question came in. Um, and this is probably generally for anybody who wants to take it, um, but it's quite um, modeling focused. Um, Elpida Bantra, who we know well from Creme Global, um, she asked this very interesting question, and I think you can interpret it a few different ways. Do smart people build smart algorithms, or do they collect and feed their models smart data? Who else well, maybe take that? maybe I'll yeah, Susan, take that, I that one. For you. <laughs> I can't say yes or no. To, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's. I, I can't say you don't need smart people to build smart models. That wouldn't be a good thing to say. But um, the models are as good and as limited uh, as as they're built to be based on their algorithms. The data is absolutely crucial. Data will always beat. Okay, I better not say. Take out the word always. Data generally beats a better algorithm. So when you're trying to get a good model or a good predictive model, for example, it's the data that you're using, in other words, what you're training on, that will make the model good. So when you're trying to get the right sort of algorithm or classifier or whatever, try different ones, but the difference will be in the data that you're feeding into it. And, this, and to come back to the smart comment, you can't blindly use data in a company, and I know that sounds very trivial, but you have to have people uh, especially if you're using sort of structured quantitative data, who understand the data. That's absolutely crucial. Because sometimes the domain experts are kind of left out of it, but it's very important that they're part of it. But data generally trumps um, algorithms, generally. Heard it here and first. Yeah. Quick question, and it came up, Susan, yeah. in your speech around uh, the CDAR model about the deep learning algorithm that anyone yeah. could use. I mean, and this is an open question, but is there a danger if you make algorithms possible for anyone to use that people start using them that aren't thinking about the data, that aren't thinking about biases, and you end up with models out there where experts who don't know the things that you need to take into account yeah. haven't been consulted? Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely. And I think that becomes even more of a risk with deep learning because then you don't necessarily even need to work closely with the data before you feed it in because deep learning will actually go and figure out what the data is about too. So, yeah, that, that is a danger. And it's, it's, it's some, I mean, that comes back to explainable AI and it also comes back to your model will only be as good to go back to it again as the data that you feed it in. If you've got bad data, it doesn't matter how clever this algorithm is you feed it into, you won't get good decisions out because it doesn't know about them. It cannot make good decisions based on bad data if it doesn't have the right information. And to know whether your data is good enough or not, you have to have people in your company who will understand what data you're gathering, what it's about, how it was, and, and to clean it and to, to, to be able to sensibly understand what each part of it is about. It's absolutely crucial. Yeah. Then try it in a few models. Absolutely, see if that yeah. Makes sense if there's yeah. weird things going on. Revisit the data. I think that's, that's yeah. crucial. Um, so, Kian Amani had the same question. Maeve just asked it. So, Kian, consider your question asked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and onwards then to um, another question from um, Darrow Darren, who's here to speak from from Boston, actually. Um, and this follows on from that. 
key issue of data. And he said, how do you then convince leadership to invest the time and the money and the, the bandwidth in gathering and structuring and cleaning that data that they just expect it to be ready to go? Um, that's, that's, that's the 80, 20 thing that takes your time, right? So any, any thoughts on that, how to get your organization to, to invest in that and, and spend time, any thoughts? Mm -hmm. I think from, from an Irish Arms perspective, it was a case of starting small. We used a lot of open source tools at the start. Yep. So we didn't go in and say, we need this much investment and this much resource in order to deliver this. And um, we very much started small, started with the information that we had, did a bit of cleaning on it. And again, showing those kind of results and those quick wins that we have in it. Um, yeah, showing the results on it. So from an Irish Arms perspective, we publish over 200 articles a day. It's a huge number of articles and content is, is what our product is. Um, so what we've done is really to make that, day, make that content work harder for for us. So we're publishing that many anyway, and we're publishing them at a certain time of the day. So by staggering the publishing, the promotion of them, um, and looking at what people want, we've we have exponentially grown the audience for that for that content. So that's showing value back, and that gives us leeway then to kind of say, well, we want to do this next, and we want to invest in this, uh, because we've shown that, and because we now have. Um, subscription product as well. We're able to show what our subscribers are reading, what's converting subscribers, what content is or isn't. So that really helps us now that we have a product that we are selling. Um, it helps make that, make that case a little bit easier as well. It's great to have that number of subscribers so you can see those trends now exactly, where people yeah. buying the paper copy, you know, you might yeah, look over yeah. a few people's shoulder and try and see what they're what, reading. What they're reading. I always do that. I'm very annoying <laughs> if I'm on the train because I'm looking at what people are reading, but yeah, how they're consuming. Now you can measure that. So. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think another thing is, I guess, if you can find examples in the media of people that didn't have good data, where they get called out and make sure that people in your company know, okay, you, found, you have good examples because you were able to get good data, mm. but actually this is what happens when you don't. The other side, yeah. yeah. Mm. So the, agree, another, the yeah, metrics as well is yeah. very important. If you, if you agree that you're going to show improvement in something and you actually prove that, then you can say, I can, I can only show it to a certain point because of the bad data. Mm. And <laughs> Um, Kleena, is there, is there a risk of um, media, uh, I, maybe even the Irish Times, becoming too data-driven you know, and optimizing everything to chase mm -hmm. those eyeballs and advertising revenue that comes with them? Yeah, it's, it is an, it, it's very important for us, um, and that balance in terms of the ethos of the Irish Times mm -hmm. um, is very, very core. Um, and again, going back to how we didn't want to bulldoze in and say that everybody has to use this and use this data. If we were only driven by the data, and our journalists were only driven by the data, we'd be writing about Justin Bieber every day and, and, and chasing <laughs> in that way and we'd never be writing about something that's happening in Syria that's important for our readers to know so we're very core on that and I think what and there would have been reluctance in that in that sense of it and it's really case that we have to trust our journalists and trust that they um, their, their ethos of what they are working there for um, again going back to the subscriptions being a help it is not about the biggest traffic drivers what is the biggest readership we do look at other metrics like engagement time and we have a long read um, a particularly um, hard hitting piece uh, Zita Boland, one of our journalists, wrote a few months ago about Anne Lovett um, and the, the death of Anne Lovett and something like that that had, you know, people reading that for, say, 13 minutes, whatever, reading the article. That's much more important than mm -hmm. um, the page views on that and, again, having the, uh, the feedback that she would get. We talked about comments earlier, the feedback on, on Twitter and other social channels um, and also, again, that subscription piece that we need to attract subscribers in, uh, people to pay for our content, and we need to retain them. We're not going to retain them if we are writing clickbait content um, in that sense. And I suppose going back to that idea of the 200 articles, it's not about changing the content as such. It's, does it have the best possible headline to explain what it is for people finding what they, what they want to find? Does it have the best, uh, the best um, image in it? Um, and are we making it easy for, for people to understand in that way? So it's, it's, it's not aiming towards dumbing down the content, but making it work harder and sometimes, sometimes I notice the headline changes on the Irish Times you know yeah. you've seen an article and all of a sudden it has a new headline yeah. and um, you go in and realize oh I've already read that article okay yeah, you come yeah. up with a good headline like that's um, key, isn't it we do it, there's a skill in that and there's also there's differences in terms of the headline can be for um, from a Google search point of view the everything you need to know about the Pope's visit was the headline that was needed for yeah. that and we would have looked at Google Trends to see are people searching for papal visit for Pope's visit is it Dublin is it Ireland what is it and um, to get those right keywords 
words. We do use he headline testing tool as well, but there can be differences in how you promote something on Facebook versus you know, how it is on, on Twitter in that sense. But there are key things, like if you're talking about a sport, uh, a match or something, like you, sh you have to have the team names, you have to have you know, these kind of things. But then when we do kind of first person personal stories, things like with a question mark, uh, we notice that headlines with question marks in them work better than, than those that don't. So there's, uh, there's trial and error, but the thing because we're looking at data in real time is that we can see, we can change a headline, we can test it and keep going, as opposed to saying, oh, if we'd known that yesterday, we would have, we would have changed it. So, Very good. Um, just moving slightly then over to the skills, um, and you know, a lot of people here would have young kids growing up uh, at various ages and various uh, stages of development in, in their education system. Um, and it's always interesting to think about what they're learning in school and what, what the work, work, world of work will actually require from them in the future. So um, what are your thoughts on, on what we should be teaching our kids um, beyond, maybe above and beyond the core curriculum of you know, basic education skills that they will get for them to prosper in this brave new world? So I'd like to start with that one. <laughs> I mean, I guess what we're seeing in, in the doc, and I think it's probably across the board, I mean, um, experimentation and curiosity are key. So mm. with things changing, and things are going to keep changing, just learning, learning a set amount of stuff. But like, obviously, impo it's important that you know the basics of your skills. So if you're a data scientist, you know about algorithms. But actually ha knowing how to, to learn continuously and being interested in learning continuously is really important. So I think in the Irish education system, we're quite good at it in primary school. Mm -hmm. but then as soon as kids yeah. hit secondary, it, it turns into rote learning for exams. And I was, I was actually, my son's going into first year next year, and I was at a, a school presentation, and the principal was talking about, oh, and these are the subjects you do. And for, in, for inter-cert, I was going to say, for, for leaving cert, and then, she, and then she got to fourth year, and she said, actually, your kids, long after they forget what they do in the leaving cert, they'll remember what they did in fourth year. Yeah. Exactly for that reason, because mm -hmm. it is, you go back to the curiosity and experimentation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think things like Coder Dojo are brilliant as well, and mm -hmm. I think it's to integrate more of not necessarily pure coding skills, but having that mindset yeah. of actually wanting to crack something open and, you know, the curiosity bit, but trying to build something from scratch is such so empowering to kids and building an application or building a mobile app. So integrating something like that. Yeah, yeah I think mm -hmm. learning by doing is yes, just absolutely. so much better than yeah. learning by sitting and listening. So um, I think we're just about out of time. So we will um, adjourn for our coffee break in the experience zone. So let's thank once again all our speakers who are excellent this morning. And I'm sure.